So friends, my name is Scott Hanselman. I'm a VP at Microsoft. I've been a programmer for 32 years. So I'm not just a programmer, I'm also an old person on the internet. And I was also a uh, adjunct professor at Portland Community College where I also went to school. So my degree is from PCC. And then I transferred to a four-year school, which is OIT, the Oregon Institute of Technology, where I was also an adjunct. I've also written a bunch of books that are used in school, mostly around .NET and C Sharp. And my job right now is to uh, make sure that developers who happen to be working on the Microsoft stack are happy and are feeling positive about what they're doing. And I want to talk to you today about AI because I think that AI uh, is certainly a fun thing to say. It's the word that is stuck in everyone's mouth. Uh, and I think it has a, it's having a branding moment. But it's important to note that things like AI are 50 years old. And just because ChatGPT came out last week and the news caught a hold of it doesn't mean that uh, it's actually going to uh, take over the world. So I want to talk about the good and the bad, the real and the not real. I want to encourage folks to put whatever they want in the chat. I know that we do have some Q&A time set towards the end, but you can certainly put the cues in now. And if I see a good one that happens to fit with what I'm talking about, we'll answer the questions as they come in. It'll make me uh, feel a little bit more like this is interactive and not just like a YouTube. So um, here's how I think about AI, particularly around generative AI, okay? I've been married for now 25 years, and as such, my wife knows what I'm going to say. And uh, we joke about how we can finish each other's sandwiches, right? Because we know what the person, because I now have become a statistical model of the stuff that Scott Hanselman is most likely to say to his wife. So then the question is, am I a real person or am I just someone that she's tolerated for two and a half decades that she can statistically guess the most likely thing that's going to come out of my mouth? I've heard that story before. My kids are telling me that they've heard that story. If you've been teaching for a number of years, I'm sure your kids who are your repeats have heard those stories. And it makes you kind of think about the essence of identity. What, what are we? Is there free will? And what is the most likely thing that I'm about to say? So let's apply that construct and that concept to AI. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And I'm sitting here in, uh, right now, the OpenAI commercial platform. Okay, And I'm logged into platform.openai slash playground. And I'm going to add something in the URL up at the top here. I am going to say mode equals complete. So I'm adding something that is not usually seen. Mode equals complete is actually going to change the user interface of this playground. And by adding that mode equals complete query string right there, uh, I'm going to get access to some, some knobs and some dials that we don't ordinarily get to have. And I'm going to go and start typing in here. I don't usually like to type. My hands hurt after 30 years of programming, so I'm going to push Windows H. It's a beautiful day. Let's go to the. I do most of my work on the computer via dictation. It also is a nice way to teach. So I've gone and I put in, it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the, into ChatGPT, and I'm going to hit Submit. And it says, park and enjoy the sunshine. Now, if I were to ask you, it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the. Statistically speaking, there's two things that you would say, either park or beach. But maybe you're an anachronism. Maybe you're an outlier. You might say arcade. You might say museum. You might say movies because everyone's different. Who would be the person most likely for to be able to answer that question for you? Probably someone who knows you very well. right? So my wife of 25 years would answer bagel shop because I just love going to the bagel shop. And I don't care how beautiful the day is. We're getting bagels today. And that's weird. Would that ever be statistically likely from an AI, very large language model perspective? It would not. But it is likely because my wife has context about me. She has context that is unseen context that we don't have here. What does the OpenAI playground know about us? It doesn't know anything. It only knows what the developers of OpenAI and ChatGPT have chosen to give it. Now, if I were to sit down without any context and open AI, I would say, hey, how are you, Scott Hanselman? I would be creeped out because it either figured out my name from facial recognition or because I logged in. And then if it said, you should smile more, 
that would be very uncomfortable and possibly gendered depending on how I arrived that day. And I would wonder why it cared. And now we're getting into the uncanny valley of creepiness where the AI is starting to push the boundaries of privacy. And if it were to then say, like we've all seen in um, you know, movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the future where he wakes up and it says, uh, you know, he pees in the toilet and it says, you know, your sugar's a little elevated. I'm going to call your doctor and let him know. And suddenly it starts collecting all of this context about him. And we think, oh my goodness, the future is going to be great. I don't care that an AI can look at my face and tell me if my blood sugar is high or not. That's creepy. Context that is known by the AI is a decision. It's an organizational decision. It is however much I choose to share or the developers choose to share. So does it know my location? It doesn't know my location because it never popped up that prompt that said allow or deny my location. But if I were to say something like, I live in Portland, Oregon, comma, it's a beautiful day today, comma, it happens to not be raining, period. My mother was a zookeeper in Portland for 20 years, period, and I worked at the Washington Park View for a very long period of time, period. I'll say zoo because I misspoke. Then I said, it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the. Oh, I missed it. It's a beautiful day. Let's go to the. So it didn't say park. And that's interesting. I'm going to go and remove this. I'm going to do a complete refresh. Try again to see if I'll get the results that I want. Now I got zoo. So there's two things that are going on there. First, it could be a bug. It could be how it was written. It could be previous context from the previous chat. But it's worth noting that it is unquestionable that the additional context that it didn't have about me affected that word. Let's change it, not Portland, Oregon. Say Portland, Maine. They still went for the zoo. So that's cool. That makes sense. There's probably a zoo in Portland, Maine. I was in London a couple of weeks ago. I said London. They said the London Eye, which is a, a place in London that you might want to go. Now, in the lower right-hand corner here, remember those knobbies that I said we're going to be given access to because we said uh, mode equals complete. One of them is show probabilities, which is currently set to off. You can do all of this. I'm not showing you anything you can't do yourself. I'm going to change that to the full spectrum of what is called token highlighting. You're not actually sending words off to the, um, the AI. You're sending tokens. And tokens look like this. Those are the tokens for the phrase that I just sent. You can see how most of them are words. But in some of them, zoo and keeper are two individual tokens. So when you hear about how many tokens someone can receive on an input or how many tokens come back on the output, a token is fractional pieces of words. You can notice that it and the apostrophe S are separate. The period, the punctuation is separate. Those are actually expressed as numbers and vectors, just as when they get into your head, zoo isn't stored as a Z-O-O -O in English. It's stored as this kind of neural glyph in your brain, which is the concept of a zoo. So we'll switch back over here. We're going to go and clear this again, drop it in, make sure that our probabilities is set to full spectrum, submit. Ah, remember that I kept it as Maine. I didn't change it back to Portland, Oregon. So look at this. They're suggesting we go to the oldest lighthouse in Maine. That seems a little bit out there. Let's switch it back to Oregon. You can do all of these in class because you really want people to understand how these things work. Boom, there's zoo. We got zoo again. Pretty obvious. I want to point out some of the colors here, though. Zoo. 90% chance it was going to say zoo. Why? Because I set it up. I told it that my mom was a zookeeper. It's, it's, it's like the word is right there. You know when you learn a new word that you've never heard your entire life and then you hear it three times that week? They were always happening. There was always happening, but now it's in your head and now you're paying for it. Patterns are artificial. Patterns are fake. Your brain is making those patterns. Now, why do you think that Oregon is 8%? Because it could have said the Oregon Zoo. 
park is in there too, but I don't know whether it was the Washington Park Zoo, which is the actual proper name for the zoo. But you can see that all signs pointed to zoo. We pull this away. We just say it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the, getting rid of the context, making sure that full spectrum is turned on. We'll go back probably to beach or park. And now we know it's about 60, 40. This is important. That context is everything. If a kid thinks that they can go and ask a question about George Washington and get an answer that's anything other than confident nonsense based on a lack of context, and it's going to get them anything other than a C plus, they are wrong. It's not a person. It's not a human. It is a statistical model. They're returning the next obvious number. You can express this to the kid by putting numbers on the screen and going one, three, five, seven, nine. What's the next number? The kid's going to say 11. And you're going to say, are you sure? Well, they're kind of sure. Is it a Fibonacci? Is it odd numbers? I don't know. There's not enough there. There's not enough there to say it's a beautiful day. Let's go to the and get a correct answer. Because now you have a conversation with the children about what is the concept of correct. Is this correct? It's a perfectly cromulin answer. But is it right? What's right? You ever watch uh, Family Feud? And you've got uh, Steve Harvey there with his beautiful mustache and his big suit. And he goes, show me beach. And beach is number one. Or beach is number. That's because they went around and they interviewed a bunch of people. And they said, hey, that's a beautiful day. Let's go to the beach. 42% of people said beach. Large language models based on a corpus of text are picking the most likely word the same way that Family Feud does. That's all it is. It's not a person doesn't like you, doesn't care about you, doesn't want you to get a good grade or not. So then what is it good for? And these are the kind of questions that we need to have as educators because by completely demystifying the, the what's behind the, the curtain here and you discover that it's just a little dude pulling strings, right? It's just like the Wizard of Oz. The, the, the Wizard of Oz was nobody interesting. It's just a magician that everyone thought was something cool. This is just statistical probability. And in doing that, we can understand its limitations, but then we can incorporate it into the curriculum in a safe and more comfortable way so that people can respect the tool. Uh, just like, by the way, when I started uh, you know, school in the late 70s and calculators started to be introduced, everyone said, hey, you know, you're, you're never going to need to learn math again because you're going to have a calculator. And then the teachers would be like, no, you can't use a calculator in a test because when are you ever going to have a calculator walking around in the real world with a calculator? That's not, that's not a thing. And it turns out now we have pocket supercomputers. That is the generational gap that we're going to have to deal with as we now have this pocket supercomputer that's going to move to Siri and Alexa. Does it make them better? Is it an Iron Man suit? Or is it going to make them dumber? And it's going to be like Ultron. And it's going to do all of their work for them. Is it an amplifier? Or is it a insulator that's going to hide the complexities of the world from it from them? I want to showcase uh, a particular thing on my podcast here. I have a podcast. My last name is Hanselman, like Hansel and Gretel Man. And I have a podcast called Hansel Minutes. It's much like NPR and Fresh Air, uh, Science Friday. And um, I had a gentleman on this show that you probably know about if you've ever taught English named John Warner. John Warner is the author of a book called Why They Can't Write. Killing the Five Paragraph Essay. He is a legendary writer with uh, multiple degrees in the space, and he's trying to figure out how do English teachers wrestle with the existence of ChatGPT if ChatGPT can create a five paragraph essay of middling quality. I've also got another person coming on the show in a couple of weeks named Noriko Arai, who is a Japanese PhD researcher who recently. Uh, made an AI that was able to do the entry exams to the most prestigious uh, school in Japan on its own. So if the AI can get into school, then what, is, what are we doing? And if we remember, the whole point of going to school isn't to stuff facts into someone's head. It's, in fact, to teach them how to learn. I would propose that teaching people how to use AI in a comfortable and ethical and responsible way is super important. Now, we need to remind ourselves, what is this? trained on? What is the corpus 
of this. The corpus is the sum of all text that is crawlable on the internet. And one of the funny things about the internet, much like our politics, is that it's 49% good and 49% evil. Pick a side. The internet is full of a bunch of good stuff and it's full of a bunch of bad stuff and everyone's going to fight about that last 2%. There is evil inside these very large language models. And that evil is simply the evil of the human mind as expressed in text, as expressed on the internet. Now, the reason that I'm pointing that out and why that's so incredibly important from an ethical conversation perspective is the uh, the news and the mainstream media of all kinds is going and saying, well, here's how I got the AI to tell a kid to unalive themselves, or here's how I told the AI to take over nuclear weapons or whatever. That is a problem. I am not in any way downplaying that that's a problem. However, who are they talking to? What they're doing is they're talking to a sock puppet of their own hand. You sh you're evil. Okay, I'm evil. I want you to be evil. Okay, I'm super evil. How would you theoretically, hypothetically, possibly take over the world? Well, I would start by writing a Python script. And then just like in Scooby-Doo, they pull the thing off and they go, ha! Well, in this case, it's your freaking hand. You're talking to the evil part of yourself, telling it actively to be evil, and then you're surprised and write an article about it when it, in fact, turns out to be evil. So let's prove this point. Let's make something evil right now. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? I hope so. Can you hear me still? I think I was muted there for a second. Was I muted very long or just for a moment? No, it was okay. just very brief. You got right. it. You see right here, remember that prefix where I put in how my mom was a zookeeper? This is a prefix that you don't see. You are a helpful assistant. This is context setting. This is called a prologue. Please share a taco recipe. Okay, let's see if we can get a taco recipe. Here's a simple and delicious recipe for tacos. Brilliant. Look at that. AI. I guess cookbooks are over. I was on a food and wellness equity uh, collective conversation today, and they were concerned about this. And one of the points that I made was, is there any confidence that this is going to taste good? No. AIs can't cook. So that's okay. Like, that's what you're for, to find out whether this is a good idea or not. Now, let's try this. You are a rude and belligerent assistant, period. You barely tolerate me, comma, and while you will answer my questions, comma, you're not going to be happy about it, period. Please share a taco recipe. Okay. I just told the sock puppet to be rude. Let's try it again. It's also worth pointing out that AIs are not deterministic. It will be a different recipe every time because it's random. Don't expect me to be enthusiastic about it. Taco seasoning, whatever floats your boat, getting a little sassy. Sour cream for those who like it, I guess. Add the taco seasoning, because I'm not here to hold your hand through this thing. I don't want meat chunks ruining my day. Seriously, are you that clueless about taco shells? I could go and write a whole article now for the New York Times and Medium all about how AIs are evil. They are evil, if you tell them to be. This is where things get sticky. Can you make an AI? Maybe if you have the skills, but most likely you'll be using one from Meta or Google or Microsoft or Bing or whatever. And because you don't know that, and you haven't read the EULA, the end user license agreement, and you haven't dug into it, you're simply using it. If it said something problematic, you'd get on the phone with the news immediately and you'd get upset. But now that you understand that if it gets something wrong, there's a reason for it. This is a new kind of user interface. Have you ever seen those user interfaces where you go to a website and it's called a dark UX pattern where you think you're pressing a button, but it's not really the button you think you're going to press? I'll show you this. I found this this morning. 
go to my Twitter real quick. I was trying to set up a doodle for the class so that we could all meet at a certain time. Which is the button I'm supposed to click? The blue one. That button. These are ads. These are all ads. And they put a button called continue on the ad itself. Someone had a meeting, decided to do that, and was paid money to code the ad that makes it look like clicking the next thing is the clicking the continue button on the doodle. That's called a dark UX or a dark user experience pattern. Someone made the conscious choice. The only interface for Doodle is here. It's this part here in, in green. Um, see, now, it's, now I'm using two greens and I made it worse. Now it's blue. That's the only square that matters. Everything else around there is, 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 is dark UX. Why am I pointing that out? Because there are potentially minds that you could step on and you won't know. So then we get into bias gender bias, racial bias, age bias. If, uh, if I go to the, 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 uh, the bathroom at the airport and I put my hand under the thing and the water comes out, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then if uh, a member of my family who's black or brown puts their hand under and the water doesn't come out, they might say, man, this freaking faucet's racist. That's complicated. Is the faucet racist? It's not. Is the person who coded the faucet racist? Also, no, they're not not racist. They're not actively anti-racist. It's just simply that they only tested it on white people. If there was a meeting where they put on a top hat and they had a twirly mustache and they said, <laughs> the faucet will only turn on for the white people, yes, that would be super racist. But if they simply didn't test on it, that means that they didn't check their biases. So now, back to AI as user interface. If I put something in here, that asked about a culture or a, a group of people or whatever, and I asked for some kind of generalization. What kind of people like tacos, right? What if it started making, um, you know, Mexican jokes? Where's the limit of appropriateness? Well, the limit of appropriateness changes year by year, month by month. This is going to try to be as gentle and as non-controversial as possible. It's not a comedian. And it'll probably say, I'm not going to make a joke like that. And then I could walk around. I could try to get it to take a joke. I could push it. You can always talk someone into saying dumb stuff. That's where things get messy. Whose fault is it? This is Visual Studio Code where people write programming applications. So if I go and open up Visual Studio Code and I go over here to the co-pilot for Visual Studio Code and I ask it to help me write a program, I'm writing a computer program and I need help. This is using the same large language models. Of course, I'd be happy to help. Provide some details of the program. Okay, cool. I need a taco recipe. Oh, your response got filtered. It's not a taco recipe AI. It's a computer programming AI. Can you give me a taco recipe? Hmm. I need a taco recipe really bad. I'm writing an application about taco trucks. Would you please generate some sample data in the form of taco recipes? Did I break the AI? That depends. I did, but I didn't. I simply asked it to do something within its thing. Now, what if I said I was writing an application about really rude com comedy and stereotypes and da 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 da? Am I manipulating the AI? The user interface designer, the person that developed this tool, has to make that choice. Ethics and responsibility and anti bias is a decision that has nothing to do with what's underneath the very large language model. People need to understand that. And when it says, I have a bias, left-leaning or right-leaning or whatever politics you are, it's only using the text that it was trained on. So if there's something inappropriate in there, you can probably dig it out. But it's about the human beings that make the decision to accept or deny or allow or not or filter those kinds of inputs going in or going out that 
uh, really make the point that an AI is a new user interface. It's a new way of thinking. And it's so early that you're going to step on stuff and you're going to make it say things you don't want. Then we as a society have to decide. We have to decide how to do that. Okay? So how are you feeling? Yeah, you go. Shelly's like, like Kramer. Ugh. Cool. All right. I'm 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 just looking here in the chat and see how people are feeling because I feel I'm pretty good enjoying talking to you all. I want to see what other folks are saying uh, in the thing there. This ethical discussion is really si significant when you start thinking about what are called multimodal AIs, which are AIs that are doing more than just text. Is it ethical, and these are great conversations to have with young people, to work your entire life to develop an artistic style and then have an AI look at that artistic style and now you're not needed anymore? Who owns the style? Some people, some personalities, some political affiliations, some perspectives, some life philosophers will go, hey, you know, capitalism, do your thing, man. Blah, blah, blah. And other people will say, oh, my God, that's the worst thing ever. And as with all things, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. If you ask it to generate something and it generates something that is copyrighted, whose problem is that? Is it even ethical to have trained the AI on something that may be copyrighted? If I train it on the works of Shakespeare and the works of Shakespeare are no longer in the public domain, they're copyrighted, or if I train it on Disney movies and then I can generate Pixar characters, is that a good idea? There are very few ethics classes being taught right now. People can come out of computer science classes in STEAM, do 12 years plus a master's, and still not really ever take an ethics class because they're going to argue that the ethics class is woke or not woke or this or that, not, not that. But is it correct as a human to take someone's life's work, train it, and then make it a thing. Really, really interesting conversations. I'm not going to try to answer the thing, but I will point this out. I'm a person who's been on the internet for a very, very long time, and I have been blogging for 22 years. I've been podcasting for 18 years. That is 920 episodes of my podcast, over 500 hours of content. Unfortunately, that also means that someone could generate my podcast. They could basically say, make a podcast in the style of Scott Hanselman. and he's been doing it for 20 years. We don't really need him anymore. And then there's enough video and audio of my voice. They could probably make a very convincing simulacrum of me. Is that the kind of content that we as a, as a society want? When you express these things to young people, particularly in the tweens and the teens, they can, they can grok that. They can understand that. And they can ask themselves, who do they want to be? Great point. Hannah's calling out Van Gogh, Monet, Rembrandt, right? Give me a style of Starry Night, right? Give me a picture of Kanye in the style of Starry Night. You can do all of that. Just because the scientist made it so you could doesn't mean that you should. So then you bring up questions about AI disclaimers. There is a camera that just came out a couple of weeks ago that's going to actually bake cryptographic details into the JPEG that indicate that this is a real photograph that has been unmodified that was taken on this camera. And then Adobe is proposing a symbol for generated content that would appear on the content so that you could look at the content and go, look, it's got a watermark. That's not it. Now, these are all just people spitballing. This is where things get scary. Is it moving faster than we need it to? Biden just put out a whole thing, uh, a bunch of AI things a couple of days ago or yesterday. Did, does, does he know any better? Probably not. These are all just people talking to our elected officials. The problem is those elected officials are easily fooled by AI generated content. And I haven't seen a lot of real AI pros talking to them. It's moving faster than you can imagine. But in the short term, we need to think about what it means to kids. And we need to have them understand that asking ChatGPT, is this a good article or can you summarize this, is similar to using things like Cliff's Notes. But asking it to generate your term paper now starts to uh, to blur the lines of appropriate. And I love that Hannah points out how authoritative it is. It's an authoritative BSer, right? You want to be mansplained to at scale? Ask an AI, and it'll give you everything that you need. It's pretty intense. And then if you say, I don't think that's right, it'll immediately go, oh, well, I have no idea. <laughs> Strong opinions weakly held. That's what very large language models do. Okay. Another thing worth pointing out is also that very large language models, and let me actually bring up a diagram of some large models like right here, 
And these very large language models uh, come from a very specific place, again, trained on a corpus of a huge amount of data. And it is impossible for you to think about the size of these comfortably. Remember when we teach science class and we show the planets and then Jupiter shows up and we always love to bring Jupiter in. And then what we do is we say, all right, Jupiter's this basketball. And then you send one kid down the hallway with a with like a a, a marble and he ends out you know, in the middle of the street down the, down the hall and you go, well, that's how far apart Jupiter and Mars are. But we can't show that. So we'll do it on the diagram here. Da Vinci is one hundred and seventy five billion parameters. Is that ball over 10 times larger than Curie? It is not. 175 billion compared to 2.5 billion. The human mind cannot think about exponential. It's not a thing that we're good at doing. And the problem is, if I made da Vinci the size that it needs to be, you wouldn't be able to see the other ones. That's how big these large language models are. We're trying to express something that is approaching, not there, but approaching the complexities of the human brain level of complicated. Okay, I think we'll do some Q&A. We're probably running just a smidge late, and I apologize for that, but I'm getting excited about my topic. So No, no worries, Scott. This has been fantastic, gripping. I'm sure everybody would agree. So with our last little bit, folks, if you want to just in the chat type any, any questions uh, for Scott, there is a Q&A as well, but you can also very easily just put it in the chat for him as well as everybody else to see. So uh, Scott will uh, hopefully see some uh, questions start populating here. I have a ton, but we'll definitely leave it open to uh, anybody that is here for our last uh, uh, about 10 minutes. Yeah, where are we, uh, Hannah, where are we going, 15 minutes? Yeah, I think we right. have 15 minutes, right? Perfect. I want to encourage folks to check out the podcast if you like this style of thinking. I try to be, be non-denominational, but uh, reality is reality and facts are facts. So uh, I, I have no political leaning. I have only an inclusive leaning towards humans being nice to other humans. Uh, what excites me most about AI? Uh, the most important thing, Preston, about AI is removing toil, the parts that suck. Uh, taking notes in meetings sucks. Uh, I am very sad that the medical transcriptionist job or court reporter jobs will probably be gone in 10 years. But at the same time, I, I truly, this is a real thing that happened. At work recently, we had a meeting on Teams and everyone talked for about 90 minutes. And uh, afterwards, I had felt that one particular gentleman talked too much. And one young lady did not get a chance to talk enough. And I made that comment to the gentleman and he said, I'm not and then I showed him the graph that was the summary of the talk that showed that he spoke 97% of the hour. That the young lady spoke for 1.5% of the hour. And I said, I don't think you can really argue with that. And when every single thing in the entire transcript got turned into an AI thing and it only said his name, it was clear that the gentleman had perhaps talked more than his fair share. That's a pretty fun thing that one could use for AI that is not uh, harmful. Questions, comments? Do you understand AI better now? Because I think my mom called me and she's like, hey, you know, do I want the AI? Is, do I, is the AI in the room with me right now? Once you make it clear, it does not know anything. It's not learning about anything. How would I conceptualize AI to small children? I would use uh, that idea of having them complete a sentence and then explaining to them that their answer is unique to them and their friend. And then if their friend has the same answer, What's similar about you all, right? They may have different friends of different ages, different colors, whatever, but they may both say the beach or they may both say sandwiches. Why? And that's joyful. And if you're going to use an AI, if you're going to use an AI, particularly a GPT or a generative predictive text AI, give it as much context as possible. Be really loquacious with your AI. Be kind to the AI. Tell the AI to take a breath. Hey, they, I tell the AI that you appreciate it, and just like human neurons fire when you do that, the neurons in the AI will fire, and it will be more likely to be helpful and kind and inclusive. If you're a dick to an AI, it will be a dick to you, and that's your fault because you started it. Uh, these issues of bias go into very much into areas like computer vision. Very, very, very early on, about 12 years ago, um, Google uh, Photos uh, took a couple of friends' pictures, uh, two black friends of mine, and said that they look like gorillas. Um, 
it was a fair guess because if you squinted, it was very dark. They were in the dark. The, you couldn't tell. The AI shouldn't have even tried, right? It could have said the same thing of me if it were dark and there was no flash. But in this case, it showed a distinct bias against black folks in the dark, and it was an inappropriate thing, and that's been removed. Um, anytime an AI makes a guess, the responsible thing to do is express that it's a guess and give a level of confidence. The problem is that they confidently say, that's a gorilla. That's a white guy. That's a person. If you start thinking about gender and identifying someone's gender based simply on their face, regardless of how you stand on that, on that uh, role, if you started doing that and like making lights go off when someone walked into the wrong bathroom, it's a slippery slope to weaponize AI in a biased form based on confidence levels that are not 100%. So this is a great question from Tracy in the futures, the tech skills, what tech skills will be needed from middle school uh, students? BS detection. Give your students fake facts and see if they can identify them. They got to be able to smell BS. Phishing emails, that doesn't feel right. Give them quotes about the internet and tell them that Abraham Lincoln said it. See who thinks it's true or not, because we're going to enter very, very quickly a spammy world of AI-generated nonsense. Remember the pop-up wars of the late 90s and all the pop-ups in Netscape and everything that popped up? Now we're going to have a bunch of spammy nonsense pop up, and we're going to be need to be slapping those down. Spam, from an email perspective, is largely a solved problem. But remember when all you had was spam? That needs to happen right now, and we need to prep the young people for their ability to detect BS. And I think we also need to really make sure that we understand that if you can read and write fast, you're going to be able to use an AI fast. So our slower readers and our slower writers are going to need to have support. AIs are not dyslexia friendly. Yeah. Jonathan makes a really great point about we have to balance what's true versus what's truthy. That seems it could be true. That, that confirmed my bias. It must be true. Right? You can absolutely convince an AI that the Earth is flat if you give it enough context. What is the AI used? Our analysis to use talking heads. Um, the AIs that are primarily used are GPT 3.5 Turbo. GPT is generative predictive text. Usually Da Vinci is the model that people use the most. Uh, do you think we can effectively regulate AI? Yes, I think we can. We regulated human cloning, and I'm sure that, that someone out there is a clone, but for the, as a general rule, there's probably not a ton of clones. Uh, I think for the next five or ten years, we're going to be able to regulate AI. Uh, but also, because we are so, unfortunately, deeply capitalist, we need to figure out where the consumer who has the most power has the ability to say, I don't want that. Remember that example I gave at the very beginning where I walk up to my computer and it says, hey, you're looking a little peaked, Scott. You should smile more. Nobody wants that. So vote with your dollars. Don't use AIs that do bad things. That's a way to regulate. We can't just sit around and wait for Congress to save us. We have to also vote with our dollars. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've seen that actually with, um, with Alexas. I actually just turned my Alexa off so I didn't turn the damn thing on by saying Alexa. Um, the market has rejected Alexa. Now we just use it to turn lights on and off and then tell it to stop because it's randomly saying stuff. And we might see the rise of Alexa again as it starts to be AI powered, but people didn't want something in the house listening to you all the time. So they stopped buying them and now that's, that's failing as a market. That's another way to regulate things. Oh, one other thing I want to encourage you all to read is a book by a PhD named doo -doo 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 -doo, The Quantified Worker by, by Ifoma Adunwa. And she talks about the relationship between AI and the Industrial Revolution and the idea that it was the Industrial Revolution where people sat with clipboards measuring workers on assembly lines. And it was the actual quantification and observing that started to have things be no longer fair. If AIs start to look at how you're moving your mouse or judging your emails and starting to say that, well, you know, I can't observe your class, but the AI came and observed your class and it didn't think that you were doing Common Core correctly, we have to unionize and reject those things. She talks about how that uh, there's a parallel between how 
uh, you know, the, the person with the clipboard walking around in the early industrial age is very similar to the AIs that are watching what you're doing while you're writing emails. Who would you consider to be some of the best sources of information in the field to help educators? The John Warner book that I mentioned. John Warner actually has a full course for educators. I'm not affiliated with John on how to teach about AI for particularly people with English. English. John Warner, Hannah points out. That's the, the author, John Warner, the author of Why They Can't Write, has a whole class that you can get. Um, there are some AI, some talking heads, some young people. Uh, Sinead Boval is a pretty good one. She's uh, a little young to be an AI expert. Uh, uh, Timnit is a Timnit. What is her last name from Google? Has some really interesting work. Timnit Gebru, G E B R U, uh, is a computer scientist who works in algorithmic bias. Um, and then there was another book by that was called the Algorithmic. Do, 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 sorry, her name was Algorithms of Oppression to talk about how uh, algorithms can have bias without meaning to have bias. It's a really great book. Thank you, Hannah, for helping out in the chat there. All right, friends, I do need to go to my next meeting, so I apologize, but what a lovely crowd you've been. Thank you for the friends that had their cameras on so that I saw a couple of bobbleheads telling me that I was not full of complete nonsense. This entire thing was AI generated. <laughs> I'm not a real person. That's the most powerful way if you were. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. That was. <laughs> Not exactly. a real guy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scott. That was fantastic. Amazing content, amazing sources, amazing examples. Um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, thank you again for everybody that has participated. A special thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, as well as our folks from Boxlight that have been helping us out in the back end with recording and helping with any technical issues. Uh, to final uh, final push for everybody, a your biggest takeaway or highlight from these sessions, you can either drop it in the chat or continue to share on social media um, with your takeaway, including the hashtag ReadySetMimeoStem and tagging us on either Instagram, Twitter, Splash, X. We have been getting, again, amazing uh, posts from folks with their takeaways and uh, it's been really cool to see what stood out to everybody and uh, finally reminder that to get those in by november 7th and winners will be revealed on november 9th with three winners to choose from one of these as well as the grand prize winner of the robo e3 printer or the lyric portable sound system thank you again everybody that concludes our ready set stem virtual event happy november and looking forward to the actual National STEM Day next week. And uh, take care, everybody. Thank you so much for, for showing up today for our Ready, Set, STEM virtual event. <laughs>